right, live from Dog Lake Brewery in Fort Worth, Texas, it's time for You Can't Brew That on television. Now here are your hosts, Brewmeisters Kyle and the Reverend Ryan Bono. What's going on, Internet? Welcome to Dog Lake Brewery in Fort Worth, Texas. Bono has been doing this for three days. It's fucking disgusting. But you are watching, and we're gonna we are gonna help you tonight bridge bridge. The, I can't speak at all. I can't speak right. at all. So uh, You're, we're gonna talk about beer tonight. We're gonna talk about beer. We're gonna bridge the gap between beer snob and frat boy. Thank you. You I welcome. apparently could not get that out. Hey. I am the Reverend Ryan Bono, and I am Kyle Brewdog Lapointe. Cantankerous Kyle Lapointe <laughs> is standing beside me, and we're here to help you bridge the gap, as he mentioned. What are we going to do tonight? Tonight, we first off... We actually have, have a really neat treat for you guys. We're going to do our, uh, our first vertical yeah, of we, the we, show. We just figured this out in the minutes leading up to broadcasting that we, we picked up two different years of the same beer. When you go to a bad store to buy beers, like, you often say, can find older bottles of beer. Like, let's say the beer store, who shall remain nameless, but it's on Beach Street in my ghetto neighborhood where a whole lot of people don't buy good beer. Right. So, you know, yes, the Bud Light will be crispy and clean and brand new, but uh, the beer that you find there in the old ales and scotches and oh, the, the Ed Hardy really ale is so. also brand new. Really? Yeah. Hmm. For for people that because there's for a lot people, of people that, that like to branch out and try. Well, because then they can wear that shirt and wear their beer on the shirt. That's right. Instead of wearing a Bud Light on the Ed Hardy <laughs> shirt, it's very important. Just be bad. So, so a special treat for you guys. We're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna vertical these two different years of the you same. You want to talk beer. about what a vertical is? I'm I'm not really sure on the specifics. So All right, you pour the beer. I'll talk. Well, you talk about, you it. Talk about the specifics. All right, that'll work. So a vertical is what uh, we refer to in the beer dork world as when you try a beer that's the same brewery, the same beer, usually a bigger beer, something that changes from year to year, and you try two different years, three different years, four different years, whatever it happens to be. But you're you're trying all the different ages and seeing if you can actually uh, note the differences in flavors. We should have poured this all in the same glass, huh? Oh, hell no. No, we'll pour a little oh. bit on each. No, that's good. No, and we'll finish it off afterwards. Okay. We don't want to have to finish the entire bottle before we try the next one. So, Fair yeah, this will work. So, what we're going to do is we're going to try this. We're going to smell it. So, try it. This is the newer one, the younger one. And and this is an exciting beer for us. The, this beer holds Still some significant... Skunky. It is a little skunky, I noticed. Which is hard to do with a beer with so little hops, but yeah. it's a bright white bottle. We actually had one before the show, and it was the same way, just a little skunky. It went away. It's not in the flavor. It's just in the nose. But yeah. yeah and, it's, pretty, it's still pretty good. And so this is the same style. of This is actually the signature beer, the signature name brand for the style of ale that we're going to be brewing this year for the Bruin Bowl. Which is a Scotch ale. It's Scotch ale. That's right. And, and this is Bellhaven's version of a Scotch ale. And... Um, you know, granted, this is probably one of the most mass-marketed Scotch ales there are. This is a very, very good beer. It's it's an extraordinary beer. I, I really enjoy it. And even the skunky variety here, I mean, what are you tasting there? I mean, I get... Uh, I didn't get any of this in the first one we had, but I'm almost getting some caramel in this one. Oh, you get the caramel, but it's from the, it's from the kettle. Right, and yeah, it's, some... there's definitely, it's definitely kettle caramelization. And one thing that uh, we've done some research in the style to make sure we're abreast of what's going on... Uh, and we wanted to be abreast of that because of the breast cancer awareness that's right. uh, stuff that's, that's going, going on. on. Well, everybody's wearing pink. Right, everybody's Except wearing pink. Us. And we're not, but um, we would. that's why we're telling you so that you'll be aware. Because uh, you... no matter what certain advertisers tell you, real men do not wear pink. That's true. But uh, you try this flavor of, of a beer, and what you're expecting is something that's really caramely and sweet, but you also get some other notes in there. And you get... Uh, you get a little roasty. I was just gonna, I was just gonna call out the roast on this, and, and it's something that that has always confused me about this style until we started doing research for tonight's show. Um, that we'll get into here in a little bit. We'll we'll talk about why that roast is there, what what brings it out. But when and that's you taste one thing. It, when, you, when you taste this beer, there is some definite roast in there. Definite roast. Uh, and, you know, not to the levels of uh, like a stout that has 20, 25 percent right. roasted malt yeah, easily. Yeah, you know, you can get up to that high. And this is probably more in the range of five, maybe ten percent 
of a roasted malt. Yeah, I was, I was going to give 5%. Yeah, I wouldn't think much more than that. Depends it, it on the style. It doesn't, take much, roasted, the... it doesn't take much roasted malt to, to change the flavor. And the color. And more specifically, yeah, the color of your yeah. beer. I know and, a lot about color. As you can see, and I, I think I might bring this beer up closer to the camera, but as you can see, this beer has a really nice, deep, yeah, bring mahogany it color to it. I was going to call it mahogany. That's what I was going to yeah, say. So let's give it a second to focus. I mean, you, you can see this is a really clear beer. Um, there, there's a, an awful lot of clarity to it. Yeah, it's a clear beer, beer, and not a near beer, but a clear beer. Right. Uh, it, and that's something that is often renowned in, in good beers that you can see through them even if they're black. You look at a Guinness, you take that, and everybody goes, oh, it's a really dark beer, but you put it up against the light, and you, you can, can see, see right through, through it. it. So Yeah, yeah it, it's a very well, very well settled out beer. Yeah, it's really good stuff. But, uh, you know, there's several ways we can get these flavors into this beer, and we're going to talk about that as far as the recipe design goes uh, on a later date but tonight what we're going to talk about and is a little bit of the broader style because in this beer design is big but methodology and practice and how you actually produce the beer is much more important so that being said we'll come about with the grain bill which can be as as simple as two malts and as complex as four as ten malts yeah. I mean, you can go way overboard in one ounce of this and one ounce of this per and, five gallons. And we're going to talk about some of the different uh, commercial examples that, that use different, different numbers of gra uh, grains in their beer, different, That's true. Different, different types of malts. And in fact, which brings us to tonight's trivia. All right, I'm ready. One, one of the breweries that makes Scottish ale, one of the commercially available Scottish ales, doesn't use any caramel or roast or anything at all. They only use pale malt, and then they color it with caramel coloring. Do you know what brewery that is? Um, you know, I, I'm not big on names. I often forget things. I'm going to go with uh, one of the big names that I know offhand that makes uh, a Scotch ale. I'm going to go McEwen's. It okay. is uh, McClay. Uh, 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 McClay. McClay. That's pretty close. I, I was yeah, Mick. Yeah, Mick, Mick, you knew it was a Mick something or That other. was right. You know, it was yeah. either Mick Murphy or yeah. Mick Daniels or... You know, all those, all those Irish names. Right, one of those things. Uh, so, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting that a, a Moving on from my racism, right? <laughs> right. That, I, I thought that was really interesting that, that a commercial brewery is actually going to, r rather than use colored malts in their beer and, and bring out those flavors... They're just using pale malt and coloring it with caramel, and, and I think that's to give it. My guess is that it, that's to give it a lighter flavor profile. Uh, or, well, or, I mean, or, you can maybe, create. Or maybe the, they're just boiling the snot out. They're of it. they're going to be boiling that thing for as long as Hours. they need to. Yeah, it's going to be at least a two hour boil, and they're going to get all the caramelization they want. And they probably have their own malt specs that they get uh, malt from the the maltsters. That, and the that's killsters. possible too. So they probably have a a deeper color pale anyway than what most people get. And so what we're saying there is basically the palest malts that make most of the beers that we drink uh, can range in color from like a 0.5 to about a 4. And that's, you know, and whereas you can get like a roasted barley or a chocolate malt or a black malt that can get up to 300. So you're talking way difference in the color spectrum. So if you got, but if your base of this is a 1 versus somebody else's 4, it's going to be a huge difference in the color yeah, when that really makes will. 80 or 90 percent of your malt. So if these guys use a four and they use it for the entire thing, all they're doing with the food coloring is trying to make it, you know, take it that extra notch and do whatever they need to do. Let's, so, uh, so we're going to talk about some of the different some of the different methods that commercial brewers use in, in their malt bills. Right. We're going to have a visit from Jen this evening. All right. Jen filmed the segment for us, and we're going to go ahead and take take a look at that in a couple minutes. That's cool. Then, um, then I'm then glad if, for that. Yeah, if we get some time, we'll start talking about this malt bill. We might even talk about the kind of yeast we're going to use. Uh, That's going to be a, a fairly, I, fairly quick. We talk about the malts, and there's a lot of differences we can go there. But when you talk about the yeast, and you talk about uh, the water, and you talk about um, you talk about the the hops. I was going to say, in a beer like this, even the hops to some extent, there's not really a whole lot. You, can you do. can't do much with those type of things. You need a certain profile from them. We both are, are not huge into the water profiling thing. Uh, you, you know, we're engineers, not chemists. So we like the processes more than we like the, uh, the calculations behind the, the I want neutrons and electrons right. and all that fun stuff that goes into that kind of stuff. No more isotopes for us. But, uh, I want everyone to see up close uh, the difference in these two bottles, all actually. All right, go for it. 
Why don't you sort of describe what people are So Bono's going to be showing you, this is the second beer we've just opened, which is a, a more classic style Scottish beer bottle, which is more uh, cylindrical in shape going up, and then it, it narrows into the neck really fast. And uh, then you've got this newer style of a bottle, which is uh, a more, I guess you could say, uh, it's convex on the inside, and it starts out broader at the base, and then narrows, and then widens back out at the top, and still has a thicker neck. And I, I think they're doing that, uh, my guess is because it's a stronger bottle. That's, that's my guess, too, is that it, because it, it is a stronger, that the neck isn't nearly as thin, so mm -hmm. you're not going to lose as many bottles and transport. And but, you can uh, definitely see just in the top, the lips thicker. So, you know, you're not going to have as much problem shipping that overseas. And this is primarily an export beer. They, they hardly sell these beers in, really? uh, in Scotland because you pay so much tax to drink this beer. People would rather drink a, a buttload of, uh, of the uh, lighter beers, the Scottish 60s, where they don't pay all the tax. Have, have you tasted this yet? I have not. The, the this older, is not skunky at all. No, by it's, the way. it's not skunky at all, thanks to the darker bottle. And in the older beer, it's it's basically been sitting in the back of the cooler for for what probably a year or so. And I feel like it's a lot better attenuated. I feel like it's a crisper drink. It's a crisper drink. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, you know it, it, what you're what you're drinking is some of the chocolatey notes come out more as uh, opposed yeah, to as opposed to like a roast. a roast. It's more of a chocolate note coming through. And it's just crisp. It's better. And I'm not getting any caramel at all in this. It's just at the back of the tongue. Once you're done drinking, the caramel lingers. But uh, Oh, yeah, it kind of sits there. Yeah, it stays there. I'm, I was mistaking that for some sort of earthy hop. But, yeah. But that's... you get a little bit of a twinge from the alcohol, too. It's pretty cool. I mean, I'm glad we did the vertical. I mean, this is really good. Uh, so if you're going to the store, I'll just tell you this right now. If you have a chance to buy the, the uh, light-bottled uh, Wee Heavy as opposed to the dark-bottled, and you have the choice, take the dark bottle. The older uh, bottle is going to be absolutely. much, much better. I think the older bottle is, is a much better, much and more enjoyable drink. These kind of beers will keep for three to five years and get better. For that, that time period, with this kind of a cap with no cork, three to five years, and they'll do pretty good. Um, so, uh, Rich, uh, so, any words from our audience out there? You can let us know if you hear anything. Yeah, or... we don't have a computer up here tonight, so if, if anybody has anything to say. We have, we have to look on. all the way away and try to yeah, it's, it's focus like, and like do that kind of away. stuff. It's, so it's, you... a, it's a real pain in the neck. <laughs> so we're trying not to uh, watch our audience talk to us, but if, if there's anything coming up in there, then you know, let us know. Okay, so pretty quiet in the chat room tonight. Jen up and running here. Me have right. for you. Bring on the beer goddess. Yeah, let's, let's see what uh, Jen had for us this week. The beer, beer queen. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Bono. It's Jennifer again. I got a couple new questions this week. My first question is from Sergio in Fort Worth, and he asks, what beer would pair well with barbecue? I recommend the Rogue Chipotle Ale. It's a really smoky ale. It's amber in color. It's going to really bring out the sweetness of the barbecue. It's going to help accent that well and bring out the smokiness of the meat. And I have another question from Kale in Norman, Oklahoma. He says, I really like the New Belgium Ranger IPA. What other IPA would you recommend? Well, the New Belgium Ranger IPA is about 70 IBUs, so one that would be close to that neighborhood of hoppiness is the Bear Republic Racer 5. It's out of California, and this one's about 75 IBUs, so it's going to have a similar hop character as the New Belgium Ranger. Also, if you want to be a little more daring, the Raw Brewery just brought out a new double IPA called Ass Kisser, and it's really good, very high alcohol, so it has a lot of sweetness to it with the hops. It's excellent. You should definitely try it while you can. Thank you so much. Please write me new emails for next week. All right. Excellent. That was, that was a really neat segment, and... Uh, Rich, before we go on and talk about Jen's segment, can you tell the audience how they can get a hold of Jen? Uh, yeah, we set up an email address for her directly. If you want to uh, send questions or comments or fan mail or anything, it's just horizons at doglegbrewery.com. Or you can also send uh, over messages to webcast or talk to us on Facebook like normal. Tweet us. Yeah, there it is. Horizons at doglegbrewery.com. Dog and Brewery. keep Since... those questions coming for Jen. She really enjoys her segment. Yeah, and it's, I mean, she's phenomenal at what she does. She really, you know, I mean, she's able to isolate the different flavors and beers without even thinking about it. You know, she's a natural. Uh, and so that kind of a thing is pretty cool for let's, us to have her as a, a resource. Let's talk about that segment. What, what do you like to pair with barbecue? 
What do I like to pair yeah, with barbecue? I'm something we have around here a lot. Uh, you know, I prefer with my barbecue. Uh, I either like to go super malty or super hoppy. So I'm either going to go something along the lines like an optimator, yeah, like a spot and optimator. I think is great with barbecue because it just it mashes meshes really well, and you get the sweetness of the malt come with the sweetness, and so it complements. Like what she was mentioning, one that uh, actually goes against, and then the flavors complement because they're different flavors. Well, this one's more complementary, and because they are of the same type, they start to taste better. Uh, and another one, I would go with something like uh, like even a ruination. You know, go as hard as you can into the hop character and just See, get and a huge coffee beer. That's kind of what I always tended towards in in the uh, in the realm of beer pairing with barbecues. I, I've always tended to like the real big hoppy stuff, mainly because I I really gravitate towards hoppy stuff in general. Yeah. But I like the idea of of a smoked like a For smoky sure. beer with with your um, barbecue. I'm, I'm thinking I might give that a try sometime. Maybe an Alaskan smoked porter too. Yeah, something like yeah, something yeah. like that. I mean, it's worth a shot. I, I think so. And, you know, it depends on the type of barbecue it, it you really, like, too. It really because does. Because do yeah. you like your Kansas City sweet, or do you like your Texas tang? Right. Or do you like, you know, like a southeast spicy barbecue sauce? What You know, what's, what's your flavor? That's right. basically a lot, where we're A lot at. of different ways you can go with that. That's cool, though. I really like that segment. So, uh, on, that, uh, on that note of, of communicating with us and talking to us about things, don't forget, with our Brew and Bowl segment, like we're talking about, the whole reason we're... We're uh, talking about this beer, and we're talking about Scotch Ale, is that we're going to brew a beer, and this beer is going to be brewed live on New Year's Day, which uh, was our, our startup segment last year. So we're going to do this again this next year. And, it's going to be our yearly deal. And hopefully some of y'all can join us. Yeah, if, if you guys I mean, want to join us for this, it'll be great. We're going to have a party. We're going to have beers. We're going to watch football. It's going to be great. Um, you know, fill me up with the rest of the old, man. That's that's the goods. Yeah, and so... so this year's Brewing Bowl, we're going to be brewing a Scotch Ale. Scotch Ale. That we're going to be designing the recipe on the air with you. Now, that being you... said, uh, one of the things we like to talk about, and we talked about this last week, is the naming of a beer. We find the naming of a beer is, uh, is a huge a lot of portion <laughs> of what we do. We always have pl puns or plays on yeah, words. We always go some, some fun way with we're, it. We're word nerds. Yeah, we are very much word nerds. Uh, I'm I'm more the word part, and uh, Bonham follows the, the latter. Yeah. But uh, that's cool, though. <laughs> and we, you know, we each fill our void. So, what I want to do is is have you guys on Facebook or via email. I, I'd prefer Facebook because I'd like it to be an yeah, open I, dialogue. I, I, I think Facebook would be the way to go. Put your ideas out there for our name for this beer. It's a strong Scotch. You can look up on the internet what is what's a strong Scotch. You know, figure out some flavor profiles. Come up with some different names, you know. Do you want to go with the Scottish theme? Do you want to go with the strong theme, the ale theme? You know, make some pun on, play on words, and, and put some of those up. And what I'm kind of thinking, uh, you know, I'm just winging this right now, but maybe uh, we have a few good names and we narrow it down to about five names. We put up a poll. Yeah, yeah, that could be fun. Yeah, and we say, okay, well, here's our best five names, and here's where they came from. Thank you for this person from this city and this person. For, I, I can definitely say one of those people will probably end up being Kelsey from well, probably from Austin. You know, I mean, we're we're gonna have some good suggestions yeah, yeah, from we, people we, out there. We've got some people who we know off the top of our heads are gonna give good suggestions. Right. So. so we're gonna go out there and do that, but we've got plenty of time, and we may not end up picking something until after the fact because sometimes we want to try the beer before we actually name it because it can be completely different from what we're intending, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah. part of the amateur home brewing process is that you don't always make what you want to make. Yeah, it, but, it uh, happens. So, speaking of making what you want to make, let's talk about the Iron Mash for a minute before we jump into it. this. Before we jump into the grain profile here, the Iron Mash we've talked about in the past. It's a really fun brewing competition. He's wearing the, the shirt. I, I am wearing a shirt. You are wearing the shirt. I am. I'm wearing a dog leg I'm shirt. The shirt. You're not wearing the shirt. I'm wearing a dog leg shirt. Um, <laughs> really fun competition here in the Fort Worth area where we get together with a bunch of other brew, uh, brewers and. Everybody is given a big box of ingredients. We have to make beer using only those ingredients, and we have to call our shot. So call our shot. That's the hard part. On the spot, we are going to make a Southern English brown ale. And when that beer is done, if it doesn't taste like a Southern English brown ale, oh, it's a Northern. Yeah, if, if, if it's a Northern, we're, we're going to get nailed on it. You know, if, if if the malt flavor, the malt is just a little bit too caramely. You know, it, it, we might have been able to change it to another style in another competition, but. And this one, we called our shot. So, that's coming up here in a couple weeks. 
The awards, the, the the beers are getting judged what this week? The twenty fourth, and they're getting judged. No, I'm sorry. The the awards banquet's the twenty fourth. They're getting judged tomorrow. Yeah, the beers are getting judged tomorrow. And we bottled award- our beers live last show, which was fun. Yeah, that actually was, and we actually did submit those beers that we bottled live. Yep, for. those were the ones we submitted, and we actually popped the top on one here today while during our pre show, and it was nice and foamy. The pepper crystal, was still good. Crystal clear. The pepper just like really jumped out. Uh, we were excited. I think bottling actually helped the flavor, you know. And I think it did. Maybe the fact that we had had so many, you know, okay, let's try a little bit of this while it's clearing up, try a little bit of this, so we were immune to the pepper. But, man, it, having that one bottle was, the pepper was so big. I, I loved it. Yeah, it, it, it was a really, so. We, if, we feel like we did a good job, you know, whether we win, whether we lose. We're, we're going we're gonna to get good scores, I think, and that, that's what we're really looking for. And, and we put I our best foot forward, I don't you know. We we have to place, but I, I just want to. We were creative. Stuff. We did a style that most people, if you talk to anybody like a Steve Brown who knows that uh, genre very well, he says that uh, that's probably the hardest style to brew yeah. because it's just there are no commercial examples. You can't get anything around here to try and taste. But, you know, we're going on words, right? It doesn't really matter if you can get a commercial example. If the words say caramel, then yep. you go for caramel. And, and we did what we needed to do, and we had a sweet beer, caramely beer, uh, we only missed out on maybe one or two of the little things that were optional in there, but hey, they're optional. So, so if you're gonna be in the Fort Worth area on Sunday, the October twenty fourth, I believe it's October twenty fourth. Uh, let me droid that for you guys. Yeah, because that would be two weeks from yesterday. Yesterday was the tenth, so that's the twenty fourth. Make sure to stop in the Raw Brewery for the awards banquet. It's gonna what? be a lot of fun. Give us a shout. Let us know how you're coming. Yeah, for sure. Because there is a. Um, a section of this where you get judged by ranked judges and yada yada so all these people there's are actually looking at it choice award. then there's a people's choice award and that's where you come in you know so we don't want necessarily everybody to come in there and just pick our beer because they you know they like us and they want, want them to pick our beer because because we're good. awesome and it's good and that's at four o'clock on the 24th by the way okay um, welcome the 24th so last year we had a good time and we had a bad beer and we still had some people said okay that's okay but you know i mean we we had about four eh, three and a half gallons of beer left when we went there and we got rid of about two gallons of it this year we have about three and a half gallons left and I'm feeling we're gonna fly it's through. gonna be gone yeah. Uh, and uh, what we learned from last year is you know, got to position yourself. You got to put signs up. You got to talk about your beer. We kind of just we, showed up expecting a little different situation, yeah, but we, everybody we, was we like, learned, "We learned a lot last oh, year." Oh yeah. We should come up with like a like a cool graphic. Okay. And like we'll we, work like, on that. Like, like, what what is the name of our beer, by the way? The name of our beer again is a Southern English Brown. So we named our beer Ye Oldie Blimey Rubbish. Ye Oldie Blimey Rubbish. So if you guys have any ideas for wanting to make a picture for our beer, if you want to make a picture yourself for our beer, send us an email. Yeah. Doglakebrewery at gmail.com. Whatever. Webcast at, at doglakebrewery.com. You know, Facebook. Yeah, let us know because we want everybody to be a part of what we do. It's a lot of fun. So, so let's talk about grain. Grain. You want to talk about grain this I wanna, week? I want to talk about grain. All right, let's talk about grain. We're going to talk about the number of different ways that brewers achieve this beautiful mahogany color that you see in this beer. And that number is two. The, the number is, is two. I thought there were several. <laughs> there, there are lots of different ways. but There's uh, lots of different there, ways. There are, there are two basic we, classifications, yeah, we, we, right? We talked about pale malt with caramel color. Right. Let's, that, that's one way. Yeah. You, can, you can go with, with faking it. You can put caramel coloring, and, which we're never going to do. Yeah. And then, uh, but... Beyond that, th- there's lots of different mixtures that brewers use. Now, sure. now traditionally... And, and again, most of these beers that you drink today are, are traditional styles. And so let's talk for just a second about the way traditionally this color came about. And what happened was your, your brewers there in Scotland would malt their grains, which meant that, that they soaked them until they sprouted. And some of the seeds didn't always necessarily sprout. or, or They're they, dead or, seeds. They're bad seeds. Yeah, they, they took seeds longer. They were bad seeds. And so... They were they were able to collect these seeds that didn't sprout, and in order to break down the husks, in order of course I don't think they realized at the time that they were breaking down the husks. They just knew that if they did this, it worked. They well, they knew they weren't going to get any fermentables from it, so right. so they burnt the crap out of them. Yeah, because so then they get some caramel flavor and some toast flavor and roast flavor. Exactly. So, as well. So what you ended up with was somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of what we were saying earlier, about 95% pale malt right. and about 5% roasted, like, deep, dark, chocolate-colored malt. 
And that mixture of 95 to 5 gives you this. It, it's pretty color. amazing when you when you consider that to like a Bud Light, where you know, yeah, I mean, there's some other different malts in there. Traditionally, it's only going to be barley mixed with corn, and they use a lot of yeah, six road of enzyme, rice. yada yada rice, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, Budweiser, especially yeah, the rice. Yeah, Budweiser's all about rice. But uh, with this kind of a beer, all you do is you throw in. A two to five percent ratio of that like teeny tiny bit of roast, really dark roasted grains, and all of a sudden you got this really dark beer. And, and you know, part part of that too is because they they caramelize it in the kettle a lot longer. They instead of boiling it for an hour, which generally and typically yeah, that's about what you want to eat for. People do that because people. it's cheaper. The less you boil, the the, the less money use, and yeah. the less fuel you use. So, you know, here at Dog Leg. Um, Everything we do is by uh, recycled methane. We actually have pumped a a tube from Bono's toilet directly <laughs> to a tank, and we take that each week. Actually, we, we might have to come up with another method because that beer and kind of stirred me up. Uh, so Bono had, apparently the beer enema he had with uh, interesting story. Well, with no, the Imperial I'll, I'll Stout, talk, wasn't I'll it? Talk, I'll talk about that later. Yeah, be another story for another day. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll finish with with my story about beer enemas. Megan, I'm not sure if you've heard that story. It's a true story. It's a good story. He he definitely had a I've, good time I've experimenting some, with beer enemas. I've some beer enema research, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and practice. So now, we were talking about malt. We were yeah, talking, we were talking about, about grain. So traditionally, that is how the, this color and this flavor were achieved. Was, That's true. was by a mixture of, of just regular base pale malt and, and roast. Well, which now, is which is basically one of the ways you can do it. There's a lot of ways of to ways. roast it. So but the main way to do it, there are two main ways to do it with a lot of ingredients or a few ingredients. And so what we right. just talked about was a few. Right. And 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 mo but modern brewing science has really brought about different ways to you get can, the same or a similar flavor. Now profile. you can do it with with a whole bunch of different stuff. Yeah. But traditionally, what you'll notice <laughs> in the uh, the professional brewing world. The majority of them use 90 to 95 percent pale malt, and then they use uh, a little bit of uh, roasted of some sort, you know, chocolate, yada yada, and then they maybe put in a little caramel if they want to, but it's not necessary. And then, uh, but what caramel does is it, you know, provides a little bit of foam because yeah. you put caramel like a caramel tan, and it'll give you a head retention because it, it provides some of the uh, proteins necessary to to make the uh, carbon dioxide actually bubble yeah and, and when we make it we might not start with a pail we, we might well i mean obviously we're gonna have a lot of pail but we might throw some like caramel tan in there or something for sure and, and give it less well, and, and that's something we're gonna let everybody out there in, in the studio audience determine yeah we're, we're, we're gonna i think next week what we'll talk about and what we'll do is bring about a few choices we've got the choice of you know and we'll go either way we don't care uh that, that's just the way we are at dog like we go both ways and uh both ways are with a big. Oh, what? What did I say? So uh, Don't worry, with we've a got big, that isolated for later. <laughs> <laughs> with a big malt bill, we can have tons of different flavors, and you can say, "Well, I want a little roast, and I want a little toast, and I want a little of this," and we can put a percent of this and a percent of that. You know, we're talking two or three ounces of of different grain. The flavor is going to be very mild, but in this kind of a beer, all of those flavor characteristics are going to come out. So we can do something like that. And then the process isn't as important, or yeah. we can go with the very few grains, and then it's a very process-rich, important uh, process. So you know, you go through and you do this. Uh, you know, you only use two different grains, but at the same time, you've got to mash it right, you've got to boil it right, you've you got to ferment just, it right. A lot more to it. You so, do it right. Yeah. So you know, we're going to look at these different. We're going to look at a few different methods, and we're going to put them in front of you, the audience. And, you know, we might talk to a few people that know a little bit more about home brewing than we do. Hopefully we can as, get a studio uh, audience we, guest here to yeah, talk about that's, this. That's Somebody with a little more uh, experience than us in this style. That's we're efforting at the moment. Because mm -hmm. as we've told you in the past, we don't know everything. But we know, we know everybody who knows everything. So, um, before we close, I want to share with everybody a fun little fact I did, dug up about uh, beer enemas. Hmm. Evidently, and I shared this with you yesterday... The Egyptians used to actually perform, and Egyptian doctors used to prescribe beer enemas back in in ancient Egypt. So, if you were in ancient e Egypt, there was a very, and you were sick, there was a very good chance you would have beer. Well, let's just leave it at that. Huh. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you, Bono, for really reaching deep and pulling that segment I, out. I, I really reached deep for that one. <laughs> so, 
You guys can ponder that one. <laughs> well, we we continue to remind you that we are not professionals. So please try this at home. Oh, God, that is awful.